Hello. Uh, my talk today uh, will be about application portability and effective orchestration across various platforms. I know it's kind of a hard topic before the launch, so I will try to be as quick as possible to make it easier for you. But I won't let you leave before the talk is over, so <laughs> let's make it together, yes? Uh, a little bit about me, uh, I am Aleš Komarek, I am a TCP Cloud Solution Architect, Engineer, I am Technology Enthusiast and I am also OpenStack Solve Project ETL. Uh, you have already heard about the OpenStack Solve Project uh, from the Jacob and Loki's presentation. Uh, it's a project aimed to install the OpenStack platform with the Solve Stack. Uh, we recently uh, added uh, support for containers in our solution, so now we are able to orchestrate both virtual machine services and uh, container-based microservices. So, what is this presentation about? We have, a, we as an IT industry, are getting into uh, serious problems lately because. Uh, there are um, conflicting demands to the industry. There is, a, there is a raising ratio of cloud services and container microservices, uh, gaining the production workload in IT industries, which uh, cannot or hardly managed by traditional orchestration tools. Also, the complex application stacks make use of multiple clouds, containers, and some advanced uh, network function virtualizations like uh, virtual firewalls, virtual load balancing, uh, virtual routing, whatever. Yes, which now is becoming the integral part of application stacks. So you cannot split apart uh, network functions and some software services. And <coughs> When a service goes down, it's the, the impact on the business is getting more serious because uh, now a uh, growing number of industries or enterprises is relying entirely on outsourced services for computing. Uh, so they need to have some strategies, some tooling that will uh, help them in case there is some form of regional outage when the connectivity goes down or where there is, let's say, some kibernetic attack that brings down the entire PC or makes the site inaccessible. And uh, also, the, one of the greatest challenges we are facing is that uh, there is a much more push on, on the change from the market. The customers are very demanding and they want to have their applications fit to their needs and they want it now. So you cannot rely on a deployment, deployment cycle that takes four months. You have to have deployment cycle or deployment pipeline that takes days to bring your new feature from development to production. But if you make things wrong and your development pipeline is a little uneasy, you can still put your stuff into production, but uh, you don't want to know how the things happen. Yes, if you, if you do not have the proper tooling, you can end up like this, that you get the job done, but it's not in a preferable way. Yes. <laughs> so to help us with these problems, we have, we have orchestration tools to help us. Uh, these tools help us with, 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 with uh, several areas within the life cycle of, the, of our deployments. It doesn't matter whether the deployment applic deployed application is entire OpenStack or some application running within the OpenStack. The, uh, the principles are the same, so we are able to reuse the same principles we use within the cloud, even for the, for the installation of cloud itself. We use it in our OpenStack Solve project. So, 
we focus not just on the installation of the of the application, but also on the operation and maintenance of the thing. You need to set up your monitoring. You need to set, set up your log collection, so you know what's happening in your infrastructure, and you can react to the, to, to it. And uh, you want to you want your systems to be as independent as possible, so human interaction from operators is not necessary in uh, most of the cases. So if you are industry and you want to add an orchestration tool into your, into your um, application ecosystem, you, you need to realize a few things. The first, you need uh, to align it with your existing configuration or orchestration tool. So if you are already using something and you want to orchestrate it entirely, you need to uh, check that it's compatible, the two solutions, then uh, depending on the workload you are having, you can, uh, you can uh, choose the proper operating system. If you are running multiple Windows VMs, you, you will choose some, some different form of, form of orchestration than when you are running Linux machines. And also, uh, you need to realize that traditional Orchestration uh, focuses mainly on bare metals and virtual machines, but the shift is uh, the pro shift is to the using platforms or the containers as the applications are getting decoupled and you have uh, you have more services to run, uh, which are uh, mostly independent and can can run uh, without the knowledge of the other ones. So now I will talk briefly about uh, several options we are having for the for the orchestration. There are um, several large groups of orchestrations we, we are having. So the first is uh, infrastructure as a service orchestration. In this case, you are orchestrating uh, virtual resources you would normally find in your physical data centers. You are orchestrating virtual networks network function virtualizations, storages, servers, so all these kind of hardware resources. Uh, the example is the OpenStack Heap, or uh, which comes originally from uh, Amazon CloudFormation. These tools orchestrate the resources in a declarative way. I will talk about this a little later. The next large family of orchestrators is the platform orchestration. These, <coughs> these tools uh, focus on a single platform of some concrete programming language, Python, Ruby, PHP, and uh, it lets developers uh, not to care about the infrastructure, databases, caches, as these are provided as service to, the, to these environments. So you just leave the platform to the, to the developers and they can they can work and they have all the services provided for them. Then you have the container orchestration. Uh, uh, for the example, it's a Kubernetes Mesos or Docker Swarm. Uh, these uh, orchestrate multiple servers on which the containers run. So one of the major advantages is that one, if one service fails, uh, you can always reschedule this failed server to another host. Uh, also, the containers are artifacts, so it has uh, minimal times for deployments. As you have seen, uh, you can run the entire OpenStack from containers within a few minutes, uh, compared to running it from uh, virtual machines, which take several minutes to uh, configure and run. Also, uh, the scalability. Uh, in your normal system, you, you would have hundreds of VMs running, uh, uh, and compared to this, you can have thousands of containers within your infrastructure. The next family of orchestrators is software orchestration, uh, more commonly known as configuration management. Uh, from this family, Solstack, Puppet, Chef, or Ansible are the most well known examples. 
this uh, orchestration provides software resources uh, in the sense of software applications and this orchestration makes sure it gets installed, it gets configured and run in the correct order and you have all the uh, software services running in the, uh, on your infrastructure. So <coughs> this helps tame the tribal knowledge as Jacob said in his presentation and you know, put it on the paper or put it into some uh, discrete process that can be repeated again and again or can be improved in some auditable way. So we, do, we don't have uh, the need for the domain experts that much. Their knowledge is put into the, into the um, orchestrating tool which can repeat the steps over and over again. Okay, this was the brief summary of the options for the orchestration for specific platforms we have. Now we'll talk a little bit more about how do the orchestration orchestrators do their job. There are two main approaches to orchestration. The first is uh, how to do it or what to do. So to make it a little clearer, clearer the declarative approach, the what? I have uh, prepared a sample. I hope the goulash is not you know, too sensitive right now, but uh, you have a dinner goulash that's set on the table and it has three to five dumpling, dumplings according to the hunger. Yes, as you can see, this is a nice example of auto-scaling topology which can react to the you know, user demand uh, and you know, scale properly uh, according to the, the need, yes? So, the declarative approach is static the representation of your infrastructure model which models each pieces so I know I have some dumplings, I know I have some gravy and I, you know, I have it on plate on my table. Uh, this approach provides some uh, configuration management database functionality. Yes, so it has some items, some resources, you, it has some well-defined set of properties and can serve as CMDB in a certain way. Uh, on the other hand, you have the imperative approach, so it's uh, the how you do it. So instead of saying there is a goulash on the table, you give the more direct orders. So it's cut dumplings to slices, cook the goulash and uh, serve it on the table with three dumplings and I will take more if I am hungry. So this is just a consequent flow of actions. Yeah, so you, you don't define your uh, final state, but you define the steps that will uh, lead you to the final state. Uh, and this is, this is how you describe various auto-prefix processes as auto-healing, auto-scaling. Uh, all these are imperative, just set of, uh, set of steps which needs to be followed. Okay, so we are back to square one because neither of these approaches uh, works uh, for the entire life cycle of the applications. For um, long running application stacks, the declarative approach is appropriate. As you define your desired uh, topology, you can do this model, you can do this topology, you then define the monitoring the local action, the documentation, which is uh, tailored to fit exact model you have for your application. And on the other hand, you have the processes which are required to deliver the change. Uh, uh, so, let's say for the updates, for the, for the healing processes, so something uh, that is not long running, but individual processes that are required to set up the infrastructure in the right order. <coughs> so, the big, the big uh, question is how do I choose the proper orchestration tools? Well, it pretty much depends on what application workload you are having. If your, uh, if your infrastructure is uh, container only, you can use tools like Kubernetes or Mesos. If you, if you 
use uh, virtual machines in your infrastructure, then you can go to uh, OpenStack or AVS, but if your uh, application gets distributed across various regions or countries, continents, or even some project within your cloud, you need to go further and uh, select some tools that does not rely on the single uh, service provider. Pro provider, yes. Sometimes even the licensing may be issue. So you need to keep some uh, of your workload on the bare metals. So you, you need to make sure that your orchestration, orchestration, orchestrating tool does uh, orchestrate all the pieces you need to uh, that define your application infrastructure. So you need to choose your tool wisely because if you don't, you know, uh, things can get a little unpredictable as, as well. So uh, sometimes magic can happen and you end up with things you are not entirely expecting. Yes. So for this reason, uh, there is a, another large family, you know, family of the orchestrators. It's platform or, or platform agnostic orchestration, which uh, does not care uh, what resources uh, it orchestrates, and uh, it actually reuses the existing, the other existing orchestration tools to enforce the states and the processes of, of the orchestrated resources. So we can call this family of the orchestrators is the orchestration of orchestration. So you reuse various uh, cloud cloud platforms or container platforms, and with the configuration management tools to uh, to solve all problems of the of the life cycle of the application stacks. So to the example uh, services that are. Uh, Platform Agnostic Orchestrators is the Terraform from HashiCorp, Cloudify, uh, and uh, even Heat can be in some way uh, seen as a platform agnostic as it has support for multiple backends, not just the OpenStack, but it can uh, now, with the proper plugins, uh, orchestrate pretty much everything. And uh, so, is there any standard way how to describe our topology and the processes? Well, what, we, what would be the point of this slide if there wasn't? Yes, so of course there is. Uh, it's called a TOSCA. TOSCA uh, is an abbreviation, it stands for Topology and Orchestration Specification for Cloud Applications. Rather long uh, description, but it's a standard in which you can define both aspects of your infrastructure, the topology as well as the processes. Uh, it's a domain-specific language. Uh, originally it was XML, but now it's uh, just YAML, so it pretty much looks like uh, heat orchestrated templates, but it has uh, more power to explain to express your software resources uh, as well as your uh, virtual infrastructure. You can use it to describe um, container microservices, virtual machines, services running on the virtual machines, all infrastructure elements. And uh, for the definition or for the description of your stacks, you can even add some uh, build artifacts along the text description or some binaries, images of VMs, of the containers, these all are tied with the, with the model, with the topology and the processes that drive it. Okay, so this is, uh, this is the architecture of uh, how, how would this orchestration tool look like. Uh, you need all these services uh, to make sure that uh, your uh, that your um, infrastructure is operational in the way you expect. So um, uh, 
at one place you have your model data, or which uh, which is your topology you want to create. Then you have some workflow engine uh, that makes sure that uh, the basic workflow gets run. The basic workflow is to install the service. So you basically start with the model, then you run the the first uh, workflow, which will install the work uh, the topology into the reality. So when the when the top, uh, when your application gets installed, uh, it beginning begins to send uh, back the feedback feedback data. So your orchestrator knows all the time what is the state of your uh, orchestrated service. So when we take our example of the goulash, you know, and the cooking, the orchestrator here is the cook, you know, who does the goulash, and the orchestrated service is the plate with the goulash. You are the consumer of the of the service, so uh, cook always see if there is enough dumplings on your table or on your on your plate. So and when you run out, you know you, you get asked if you want more or not, depending on your demand. And if you want more, the cook makes sure that you get you know your refill. You know? So uh, this how do the orchestrator uh, perform the long time maintenance of all the systems. Yes, you know, it always observes the orchestrated uh, infrastructure and uh, reacts if some policies are breached. Yes, so my policy is I, if I'm still hungry, I, I won't pour dumplings. Yes, so it will happen. So now let's talk about some of the major use cases the orchestration engines are having. The, the one of the biggest issues it's solving is to create complete CI/CD pipelines. Uh, in this case, you need to create uh, multiple environments of your applications. Uh, you, you need to create uh, multiple development environments. Then you need to create several staging environments where you test your new, new features. And then, of course, you need the production environment one or more depending on your architecture and uh, you need to be able to create, to destroy, to work with these environments in a rapid fashion. So if you, if a new developer comes into your company, it needs to take at most few hours to get him uh, up and running, not, uh, not, few, uh, not few weeks or months. Also, uh, you need to make sure your uh, system is ready to respond for the outage or let's say some unexpected load peaks. So uh, uh, you need to uh, feed it with the proper data from the, from the system itself so it knows when to react. Uh, we are using this approach to implement cloud service brokerage platform which does nothing more than we put some UI in front of our orchestration engine and it does it does the job. Yes, so and, uh, this is one of the last slides. Uh, this is this shows how uh, some example of what complete orchestrator services have. It cannot utilize just one service, it's always a collection of multiple services. As in the Linux, in the Linux world, each service does its job and it does it well. But for this reason, you need to uh, have more services, each doing its job well, to have the complete system up and running. So for the OpenStack salt, the orchestrator is the salt stack. We use Reclass uh, to store the data, collect the Senzu Heka for the monitoring part. Uh, of the gathering data and graphite elastic search for the for the storing the data. And compared to this, there is a Aria Tosca project, a recent one, uh, which uh, uses Cloudify as orchestrator and uses the Tosca language to describe the topology and some other services similar to ours uh, that uh, make sure that the system is running in the right order. Okay, now finally we have the demo. Okay, so I will sh sh try to. Uh, where, where do I click here? Okay. 
language. So can you highlight the benefits of Tosca versus Yang with this model? Uh, what is the uh, VM? Or Yang. Hmm? Yang. Uh, <coughs> no, Yang is for, to define the network functionality more than the Tosca is more to define the service-oriented architecture. Yes. Uh, these two can work together, but uh, you can model your stuff in Tosca and then you have some uh, tools which will translate or transform the definition from Tosca to Yang. Yes, yeah, so these can uh, coexist together with, with one solution. Okay, thank you. So, is it the lunch time? Uh, Alesh, uh, can, can you please compare Tosca and, uh, for example, the Compose files for the Docker or, or for the Kubernetes or even with the uh, you know, heat stuff? What are the features? Or what's, what is promising for the future and the differences? Mm, the Tosca is just the way how to model things. It doesn't care whether it's VM or, or microservice. Uh, it's completely technology agnostic, so uh, it's just basic set of rules to describe virtually anything. Yeah, you, you just have some you know guidelines how to use it, but the implementation is up to you. So uh, you can uh, you can have it to define your Docker Compose files or your heat templates. It provides the same functionality, which can then be used for other orchestrating tools to use. Hi, so Tosca as a standard being led by a committee, it seems to be not necessarily as fast moving as many of the technologies in this space. Do you think it's going to be able to keep up? Uh, Tosca is just a, a specification. It does not, it's not the orchestrator, it's, uh, it's just the way how you uh, define, your, uh, define your application stacks, uh, both from the topological and the process view. So you can always, you can reuse this data from any software you want. And I think uh, it's a standard which is being evolved. The new version is coming uh, this summer which is solving some metadata and policy issues or, you know, things that were not covered well in the, in the, in the current uh, standard. So, 
I think it has good place on the market because it's a standard on which major players agreed upon and it can be implemented by anyone and, and you just have uh, your application described in this language and there is a good chance that you will be able to take this definition and uh, move it across uh, orchestrating providers in the future as the support for this specification, the reading or parsing this definition is getting larger, so you have more tools which support reading Tosca, specific, uh, Tosca topologies. And I think it will be growing in the future as the standard is alive and uh, actively evolving. Yeah. So thank you and have a good lunch.